Table two, please. T t table two. Have y'all selected your spokes spokesmen? Y'all got all guys at the table. You're not spokespeople. Spokesperson. Hi. Um, Hi. I think I suppose from just discussing with the guys here, um, the main the main crux of the problem and the main pain at the moment, and not harping on about it, is the GCC form of contract at the moment and how how I suppose it's an adversarial form of contract whether we want it to be or not, but that's the way it's shaping out to be. Um, and like Ralph was saying earlier, that maybe, you know, that wasn't the, the idea yeah. behind it. But from a designer point of view, a contractor point of view, it seems to be, you know, it, it does seem to be the main bone of contention in the industry at the moment. And if we are to implement this kind of all-encompassing um, strategy, I suppose, to get BIM over the line and everyone kind of groups hug, group hugs and, and kind of gets it over the line, you know, um, that this big hurdle has to be addressed and addressed, you know, uh, very de in a very detailed manner because at the moment it's it's it seems a million miles away. That's our main that's our main issue. Okay, so the so essentially the fixed price contract that GCCC has put out there and said this is the way we're going to do business. Okay, table three. Yeah, uh, w w one of the, uh, just a again, a, a, a sound bite, the uh, uh, need for a, a paper trail and to maintain a paper trail, I think the, uh, that sort of fosters a, a culture of adversarialism, uh, and I think uh, one of us felt that we should get away from that. Um, in particular, the GCCC form of contract, I, I think, has been born out of a, a very adversarial culture and atmosphere anyway uh, and I, I don't think that really is serving the um, the industry very well at the moment um, one of us felt also that uh, there was a lack of trust uh, between the uh, traditional design team uh, to start with and uh, that I think uh, is is uh, hindering contractors and specialist con subcontractors from buying into the um, uh, the, the whole uh, idea of integrated project delivery, you know, it requires a, a degree of uh, uh, trust and a, a willingness to share um, uh, b business models. Um, and, and one question uh, we have for you really is, you mentioned the US Corps of Engineers. Um, how are they actually, uh, what, what criteria are they applying to to bids from integrated project teams uh, to, to actually choose a successful uh, bidder and evaluate uh, what is value for money? What, what the, the US Army Corps is not one of the entities that is doing IPD or even IPD light. Now the General Services Administration, the GSA, is trying to get more IPD. What the U.S. Army Corps bids on is generally a design build. So they have, they utilize the design build model. So they contract with a, what is often a general contracting firm that has either joined forces with through a joint venture agreement, a major design firm, or that general contractor will have in-house design talent that's going to design the facility themselves. And so they, the, so the, they do not do IPD. What the Army Corps does have a BIM mandate though, and they mandate that the BIM be delivered in a Bentley compatible format. So what happens is it gets created out here in various forms and then comes to them and it gets converted and turned into a Bentley. It's a very inefficient process. So the U.S. Army Corps, they know this. I've told them this. <laughs> they have some work to do. They need to, they need to up their game on the IPD side. They're doing a very good job on the BIM and operations and management with BIM side. They're really leveraging BIM well. Uh, so let's go on to uh, table four. Um, there were a couple of different things thrown out there to your question. Um, and in the brief time that we had, uh, we discussed the, one of the pain points being the trust between the contractor and the design team. The feeling was that 
that often the design team works well together, but there is a, an issue with the contractor, and that's ultimately a, a fundamental um, aspect of design bit build. And even if you have the public works contract for design and build, um, you have an issue where a contractor is running the show once he's won the job and is driving the design team further and further to save costs and try and get away with providing the best value to the client. So this all comes back to the initial model and where uh, one of the other issues that was raised at the table is the, the distance the client has from the project and from the understandings of how they can get the best value from the project. And many clients in Ireland now have their hands tied by the public's work, public works contract. And even if that contract isn't gonna be changed in the foreseeable future, there's a, you know, are there better ways to apply the contract? And can the design and build aspects be improved to uh, try and ensure that the client is getting the best value? Um, and, and, and that's a, a question that maybe can't be answered here today. But the, one question that I had just from earlier is, is you mentioned that the construction industry is not a trusting industry. And I wondered if you had an example of a trusting industry where uh, where multiple partners do work in a trusting fashion and, 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 and deliver value for their clients? That's a great question. Um, yeah, y'all are not, y'all shouldn't feel like the Lone Ranger. You're, the, the trust issue is, it, it is, it, it, it runs the gamut throughout the economy. and gets at, you know, I mean, what we're talking about here are true game changers that we're really talking about trying to alter our business model, aren't we, in a way that, uh, that allows us to, to be more collaborative. You know, some of these new online systems like Facebook and, you know, the way that kids collaborate and the uh, World of Warcraft game, the guys that play World of Warcraft, you know, have several continents removed from each other and coordinate and collaborate, you know. The, the, there's, some, there's some interesting trust-based things going on out there that, that I think we can pay attention to and learn from. But you're right, I think in business, generally, we tend to be not trust-based. Yes, sir. It, it's my sense, uh, my name is Damien Duffy, I'm from the NDFA, and we're a procuring, we're a public-private partnership procuring agency. It's my sense that a lot of the things that's been spoken about here and you know, the traditional forms of contract, PPP actually gives us a great opportunity to break down a lot of these barriers because the consortia are formed by all of the chief collaborators, the contractors, the designers, the FM guys. They all come together to work up a solution. And they have the longer term motivation to make you know, the positive attributes that clients are look at, looking for in an asset to work themselves out because they have a lifetime or life cycle state in the pro stake in the project. Yeah. So we're of the view that, or forming the view that, you know, the PPPs are probably a very good place to start with these new cultures that you talk about, the change management, the sort of the culture that requires to deliver um, BIM, not just the sort of the technology milestone requirements, but actually the ones that really deliver the value. Um, you know, the, the contractors, obviously can see great benefits, I'm sure, in, sort of the, in, the build, in, in the building exercise, but when they start leveraging what their designers are creating as value, the FM team partners are creating as value, um, that's very powerful stuff over the lifetime of, of an asset. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what clients need to see, to know that they're setting up an asset for better long-term value. And that's a very important uh, requirement for us right now because energy, and how buildings perform over the longer term. And you've had figures on the board this morning about uh, the costs, the running costs. Right. That's going to be more acute cost yes. of air going forward. So PPPs, I think uh, there's a good opportunity. Yeah, the, the P3 concept is a really powerful tool. Um, they've used it extensively in Western Canada. Um, the, there, there are a few cautions with it. Um, and I think y'all probably, it's great to be getting in on the game at this point because you get to take advantage of the prior, you get to see the mistakes that were made and make sure you don't make those same mistakes. Um, the, the big one is that, you know, the, 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 the 
new infrastructure gets kind of ridden into the ground and the owners, the public, gets a shell back that's sort of been, had the value wrung out of it at the end of the process. And I'm sure y'all are aware of that happening in the past and there's, you can deal with that through specifications and there's some ways to make sure you're handed off something that's still viable. Um, the other prop, there's, a, there's an issue with P3s in Western Canada and it has been that they are almost, uh, the, the cap in Western Canada, both BC and Alberta, have a $100 million cap. So they only do P3s in a, uh, if the project is worth $100 million or more. And when I was presenting out in Western Canada, I met with several general contractors and several big designers who participated in uh, trying to win work through the P3 process out there. And they all told me, James, we won't bid on one that's less than $250 million. If it's not at least $250 million, we don't want to have anything to do with it. And the reason for that, in large part, is that they spend, you know, two and a half, five, seven million dollars preparing for the dog and pony show and making the presentations. And the, the folks that are in charge of the program told me, they said, well, James, why is that a problem? They're going to win at least a third of the time. They're guaranteed almost, there's only a few people that can do this in, this, in, in the entire country. They're going to win at least a third of the time. And I'm like, dude, that means they lose 66% of the time. So where do you think they're putting that $5 million? You don't think, you, you think they're really not adding that to your cost somewhere in the next project? They're going to get that back somewhere. They're not going to spend all that money and not try and get it back somewhere. So I, I'm not at all familiar with the type of P3 that you guys are doing, but I know that that's a, that's a caution from Canada. I would also recommend that you all look very closely at the brand new P3 statute that was written in the state of Arizona. Arizona has a really really good group of construction management programs and stuff at their, both the University of Arizona and Arizona State, and they have looked at P3 very, very closely, and they think, as you do, that it is a real value add, and it gets all the right people to the table early and everything, and I, and I agree with all of that, and they've written a specific statute that authorizes P3 in the state of Arizona, and they've taken into account the shell, you know, the empty shell problem, and they've taken into account the big problem. And I think that's an issue for Ireland because if you have a P3 program that only the big boys and girls can compete for, then we're leaving our SMEs out, and we need to make sure that they have a way to participate as well. And I'm sure y'all thought about that, and you don't want, you know, to have that model that's in place in Western Canada, repeated here in that respect. But it's great to hear that y'all are looking at P3s because I do think they're a, they're a really good potential uh, solution. Let, let's go on around. I think, I think, we? I think we're going to come, come to end of time. This man could speak all day. He's been on his feet for over an hour. Uh, I think we've been listening to a game changer this morning. And I think you'll agree with me that uh, it's been a very exciting presentation. And I'd like you just once again to give James a round of applause for his time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you John. Thank you. I'll hand you over to Alan, who has a few words for us all. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, John, for your excellent chairmanship this morning. John has been supporting CETA now for... 11, 12 years, from the very, very beginning, uh, John stepped up to the plate and he's been there since, uh, which is fantastic. Thank you again. And to James, I mean, absolutely fantastic presentation. I couldn't keep my eyes off him this morning. It was, it was really, truly inspirational and I'm sorry we kept him out late last night, uh, but um, and I hope our hospitality, uh, we've shown you a very welcoming um, um, to, uh, to Ireland. Um, so, I mean, super presentation by James, um, lots to take away. We're meeting again on the 21st of November. 
it's, it's the last, um, but not the least, it's, it's the last of our, our series this year. We have um, Judy and Kimpian, who's talking about leveraging BIM for uh, sustainable low carbon futures. And, you know, we have, we're also welcoming back David Phelps from the UK, who's going to um, educate us more on what's happened in the UK over the last 12 months in regard to the BIM implementation. And he did say at the very beginning that uh, cash is king and carbon is queen. So he's, he's, he's going to revisit that whole concept and, and update us on that. So very, very much grateful for David for coming back. Um, with, with this talk this morning um, from James, there was one word that really stood out for me. Uh, it wasn't BIM, it wasn't IPD. It was smart, the word smart. And if you break that down, um, the Alliance is on a journey, as John said, over the next number of years. Um, where the seat is going to, to go over the next two or three years is really down to the members uh, and what, the, what it is they want to do. And also, the funding bodies need to maybe uh, step up to the plate and maybe consider continuing to fund the Alliance into the future. If we look at that word smart, um, and we're building our, our strategy for the next three years, we've got to have specific targets to set ourselves. We, they have to be measurable. I mean, this morning is measurable. The fact that you're here is another box we can tick off. All the people in the room add to our KPIs. Um, we need to agree uh, these objectives. We need, to, we, need, we need to agree what it is heat is going to do over the next two or three years. For example, we need to agree what we're going to talk about next year. Do we continue with the BIM series? Do we mix it with other, other topics? We need to be realistic as to what we can achieve with the funding that we have. And also we need to have events uh, and training programs that are realistic uh, from the point of view of a business reality. In other words, that we're talking, we're bringing people over like James to Ireland to talk about business, real business issues that you're, fa that you're facing out there. And lastly, we've got to do this within a time bound, you know, we, we're time bound. So that word smart, I was just thinking about it this morning. It's, while it's a different, I'm using it a different, from a different acronym point of view, the acronym is still important to us. So thank you for coming along. Thank you for your continued support. We'll see you all in November. And uh, we'll have a much better understanding in November as to this, the roadmap for 2013, 2014, 2015. And we hope you, you can give us your continued support. Thank you very much. Thank you.